Well, I'm really happy to be talking today to Sherry Berman. Sherry is a professor of political science at Barnard College. She's written extensively uh, a lot on European politics. Uh, she wrote a book, uh, her last book was really one about the development of democracy in Europe, which I think had a bottom line roughly to the effect that democracy wasn't such an easy thing to put in place, uh, even in the region where democracy was born. Mm -hmm. uh, and she is in the process of writing a book about the decline of the uh, the left in Europe and the rise of populism. So maybe we can just begin with that topic. Um, uh, you know, there's been a lot of worry about the election of populist governments in Italy and in Sweden, and of course there's the AFD and Marine Le Pen and all of these. But I've heard you say that you actually think that that populist threat is actually stronger in the United States than it is in Europe. Maybe you could talk about that a bit. Um, well, thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Um, and yes, I think that's actually true. Um, so we talk about the rise of populism, particular, particularly right-wing populism, and we treat it as a kind of homogenous um, uh, phenomenon. And while obviously these movements on both sides of the Atlantic have things in common, I think from the perspective of um, threats to democracy, the developments have actually been starkly different. So what do I mean by that? So we have, of course, right-wing populist movements in Europe. You mentioned that in Italy, we now have a right-wing populist government. In Sweden, Sweden, Social Democratic Sweden, we now have a um, right-wing populist party that got the second largest number of votes in the last election. So it's not part of the government, but it supports the government and right. is the second largest party. But what's interesting about what's happened to right-wing populism in Europe is that since the time when it first emerged on the scene, so parties with clearly right-wing populist profiles in the sense of sort of, you know, having an anti-immigrant kind of stance and positioning themselves as anti-establishment and against the mainstream parties of the center-left and center-right, these parties have really moved dramatically from what might be considered to be a sort of radical right um, profile. Mm -hmm. uh, that is to say, these parties often had roots in neo-Nazi movements, which they did not um, push themselves away from. They were um, very problematic, not just on liberal, but on democratic grounds. Their stances on immigration were sometimes more than dog whistling to overt racism. That is mm -hmm. to say that the uh, oblig uh, the um, objection to immigration and to immigrants was that they were ethnically, religiously, racially different from us. Mm -hmm. Now, oh, what's happened since the late um, 20th century, when many of these parties emerged, is that they've really shifted, as I said, they've moderated in really important ways. So all of the ones that have achieved political success, including... Um, Maloney's Brothers of Italy in Italy and the Sweden Democrats in Sweden have moved themselves away from those neo-Nazi roots. Now, what does that mean? That means that they've they've said, we don't have anything to do with that anymore. Anyone who has open ties to those movements is thrown out of the parties. They reject any connection with them, sort of akin to the way communist parties did in Europe in an earlier era. That is to say, they started off as anti-democratic parties with close ties to the Soviet Union. By the 1970s, they said, we support democracy and we are not pawns of the Soviet Union anymore. Similarly on immigration, these anti-immigration stances remain important to these parties, but they're no longer framed in racial, ethnic, and religious ways. The objections to immigration often now are framed in economic terms. We just want to protect our welfare states and we want to protect our workers. We have nothing against immigrants who assimilate to our culture and values. Now, a lot of people think that this is just talk and that underneath these parties are actually, you know, sort of neo-Nazi. But the point is, is they have felt the need to moderate in order to gain votes and access to power. And that's really important because what democracy is supposed to do, if it's functioning mm -hmm. well, is it's supposed to tame extremists. It's supposed to make them realize that they will never gain power, they will never gain votes if they openly advocate anti-democratic, racist 
violent positions. And I would say that a lot of parliamentary democracies in Europe also have proportional representation. They require coalition governments. Uh, you know, Sweden Democrats can't govern on their own. Uh, and so that's one more institutional rule that also promotes, you know, some degree of moderation. It's possible. I'm not, I'm, I mean, yes, I mean, proportional representation systems have very different dynamics, right? So if you mm -hmm. want to join a coalition, right, you have to have coalition partners. But again, the point is, is that they felt that they would never be able to gain the acceptance of other parties on the right if they maintained a profile that was openly racist and openly anti-democratic. Now, what's the contrast with the United States? The contrast with the United States is that we have, have a Republican Party, regardless of what you think about its policies on a whole variety of issues, that has moved in the exact opposite direction, and that openly embraces and openly embraces election deniers openly embraces people who are trying to change the uh, rules of the game in ways that would um, make our democratic system not so democratic. Um, people who um, supported, um, condoned uh, an uprising on January 6th. And that's not the way a healthy democracy is supposed to work. There are crazies out there. There are extremists out there all the time. The point is, are they encouraged or are they pushed to the sidelines? And what we've seen in the United States is a very different dynamic within the Republican Party. One might have thought, um, you know, in line with old fashioned and a very overly simplistic version of Anthony Downs, right, that one of the two major parties, speaking of rules of the game, as you said before, could never go in this direction because it would mean, by definition, giving up the center voters. But that's not what's happened in the United States. And that is a reflection of a whole variety of things, not least of which is that our democracy, I think, is more troubled than those in Western Europe. Sherry, so maybe we can talk about why that difference exists. Now, I don't want to beat a dead institutional horse, but, you know, the argument has been made that our plurality voting system coupled with um, popular primaries in both parties has actually driven some of that uh, extremism. Uh, and if we had something like ranked choice voting or now the current, you know, proposal is top five connected to ranked choice voting, then there would be a greater uh, moderation in both parties because, you know, with popular primaries of the sort that we have now, the people that come and vote in primaries are always more extreme than the average voter within the Republican or the Democratic Party, and that explains, you know, to some extent, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders and the like. I mean, what do you think of those kinds of explanations? So I think institutions do matter. I'm not sure I'm convinced that the majoritarian versus PR system is the most important of those institutional factors, simply because we've seen a change over time, and that institutional factor hasn't shifted. I do think that things that do seem to have changed or developed over the past couple of decades, along with this polarization, and I would say eventual radicalization of the Republican Party, are some of the other things. So primaries, this is something that um, uh, a lot of people have discussed. We have a primary system that ironically was put in place to increase the democratic, small d democratic aspects of mm -hmm. primaries, enable more people to have a say in who parties candidates were rather than the, you know, sort of old back room kind of situation. But because of the way primaries work, and in particular the fact that not that many people actually do participate in them, the folks who do go are the most committed partisans. Those are not people who are representative of their parties, much less of the electorate. And so someone running in a primary has very little incentive to appeal to anyone other than the people who are going to come and vote. And those people, again, tend to be more extreme. They're not representative. S a similar kind of dynamic in that we have too many safe seats mm -hmm. in the United States, right? So if you have a safe seat, that is to say, you know that your seat is going to be won by a Democrat or a Republican, right? Because that's just the way it is. Then you have no incentive, again, to appeal to anyone in the center, much less on the other side of the aisle, because the only thing you need to win 
is to get those people in your party um, who are most committed, again, to come to the voting both booth. So there are definitely institutional things that could help shifting our primary system, rank choice voting, all of those things I think would make a difference. I think they better reflect the changes that, you know, they correlate better with the extremism that we've seen in the United States that has grown over the past couple of decades. Underlying this, of course, mm -hmm. as I'm sure you've talked about many times in this uh, this pod, uh, this this uh, you know uh, sessions. These sessions are um, you know underlying social and economic yeah. trends. Okay, that, well let's, yeah. let's talk about those. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I mean, look, you know, institutions channel grievances, preferences, and interests. Right? They're there to kind of translate them or help translate them into outcomes. So they matter, right? But what's going on within society and the economy is the sort of raw stuff of politics, right? And we know that, again, in the United States, we've seen even more dramatic shifts than we have in Western Europe. Inequality, geographic divides, uh, payoffs, increasing payoffs from things like education and having well-to-do, um, highly educated parents. That is to say, diminishing social mobility in the United States. And all of these things entrench divisions mm -hmm. in society. They create resentments against people who are seen as either disproportionately benefiting or sucking up resources and complaining, quote unquote. And it makes it very easy to find simple scapegoats because most people don't have time to unfortunately listen mm -hmm. to podcasts and write, watch you know, um, newscasts and read the New York Times and endless political science journals. All they know is that there are problems, they're not getting solved, and so when someone comes along and gives them a very easy reason for that, it's all because liberal elites disdain you, it's all because immigrants are taking away resources, it's all because minorities have gotten too demanding. Well, I mean, you know, that's not the correct answer, but it is a simple answer. And people who are suffering and who feel very divided from their fellow citizens are going to be much more likely to buy those kinds of answers. Well, but is that really sufficient to distinguish the U.S. from Western Europe? Because you've had deindustrialization in Western Europe. You've had an increase in inequality almost everywhere, not as dramatic as in the United States, but certainly... Uh, globalization is something that's hit the working class in very many countries. Um, there's one thing that really does make the United States different, which is our racial history. And I would think that that's also kind of an important factor in shaping the rise of this new populist right and the new kind of nationalism that it espouses. Absolutely. I mean, so the racial um, division in the United States is obviously a long-standing and deep one, right? But the question is, why has it become an even more powerful wedge of late? Um, and you see a somewhat similar thing in Europe, although it's of less long standing, in the sense that immigration mm -hmm. becomes the kind of cultural or social issue around which a lot of these resentments pivot. Um, it is true, however, that the things like inequality and social mobility, those things that are worse in the US, that is to say we have more economic inequality and lower social mobility than in Western Europe. So the, the economic trends in the United States have been noticeably worse or more difficult than those in Western Europe, although surely you are correct that they, you know, deindustrialization and geographic divisions um, and educational divisions absolutely play a role there, but they are more um, pronounced in the United States. And racial divisions, right, are deeper and of longer standing, and so triggering them or using those as a wedge is an even more powerful tool in the United States than it is mm -hmm. in Western Europe. I mean, one thing that reflects that is that um, right populist parties in Western Europe were much earlier to pivot towards what you might call a pro-welfare state position than you have seen in the United States, where we're first beginning to see that really take hold in parts of the Republican Party. Why? Because that welfare state, which is protected against even more dramatic inequality and prevented even less uh, horrifying trends in social mobility, that is accepted by Europeans, right? They recognize that as important, not just for protecting the least well-off, but as necessary for social cohesion. 
And so that has a, that is a much more prominent part of the profile of right populists in Western Europe than the U.S. And um, the very fact that um, you now see more working class voters in the Republican Party who are suffering from precisely these economic trends is why you're now seeing more people in the Republican Party openly calling for a shift that is exactly similar to that which right-wing populists in Europe started quite a while ago. Yeah. It does seem to me that the racial and ethnic element also s explains something about the lack of working-class solidarity, right? The 20th century left was all built around working class, their trade unions, uh, and, and, and anchored in a clear social group. In the United States, that kind of solidarity was always a little bit more difficult because of the racial divide and white workers could see that they were actually not at the bottom of the social hierarchy, that you had African Americans, immigrants, and so forth coming in underneath them, and they wanted to, you know, distinguish their status from, from, you know, that of the people that they thought were even lower. Whereas in Europe, you know, that's beginning to happen with immigration, but, you know, you still have a working class that is, you know, they have their own social democratic parties still, and you know, it seems to me there's a little bit more cohesion there on class lines. So historically, of course, that's been true, right? You know, sort of mm -hmm. the classic question that um, historians of the left have asked of the United States is, why no socialism in the U.S.? And mm -hmm. one of the most convincing and obviously important answers is because the working class was so much more divided in the United States, obviously on racial grounds, but also with waves of immigration on ethnic grounds and on religious grounds, and those kinds of divisions are really antithetical to class or economic solidarity, mm -hmm. which does sort of bring us back to the current day and mm -hmm. left strategies. But but that is absolutely true. And in that way, what we're seeing a little bit in Europe is a kind of lag behind the United States, right? Because European societies have gotten so much more diverse over the last generation. And in some of these countries, like Sweden, for instance, you have levels of diversity, ethnic diversity, racial diversity, religious diversity, that actually now surpasses the United States. Mm -hmm. But the difference is, of course, that this has happened in the space of a generation, as opposed to over the course of, you know, an entire history of the United States, hundreds of years, right? And we've had hundreds of years mm -hmm. to deal with this and have not done a very good job. So it's, it's no surprise that we're beginning to see these same kinds of dynamics in Europe. And so what you're seeing now, just as in the United States, is that these right-wing populist parties in Europe are now in many places uh, the most um, popular party for working class, low educated mm -hmm. voters, right? So if you look at, again, parties like the Sweden Democrats or the National Front in France, which is yeah. the probably oldest, uh, most influential of these parties, these are now parties of working class, low educated voters. So they used to all vote communist in France and now they're voting or, for the or National social, Front. Or in France, they yeah. would have voted communist, mm -hmm. yes. In Italy also, in mm -hmm. places like Sweden, it would have been for the Social Democrats, in mm -hmm. places like Germany. So it depends on what the predominant party mm -hmm. of the left was. But yes, you know, if you went back to the post-war period and you knew someone was working class, it wouldn't guarantee that they were voting for the left, but that would be your best bet. Mm -hmm. If you had a bet now, actually, in a lot of countries, including France, and it's now 50-50 in a place like Sweden, and someone said, I'm a working class voter or I'm a voter with the equivalent of a high school education, you'd be just as likely to be correct in your guess if you vote if you picked a right-wing populist party mm -hmm. than if you picked a party of the left. Yeah. Okay, well, now I've set up a perfect segue into the other big topic that I wanted uh, you to talk about, which is the decline of the left. And so we've already begun that conversation. So this racial, ethnic, immigration component is part of it. But w what are some of the other factors? Because it is really remarkable. You know, the French Socialist Party basically just disappeared. Yeah, a doesn't few years really ago. exist anymore. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the German Social Democrats have shown continuing weakness, even though they're now back in the government. I mean, there's many examples of this. So what, what, what other broad ex explanations are there for this decline? So, yes, you know, we've seen parties of the left overall from an electoral perspective in Western Europe decline significantly. Um, cumulatively, something like, you know, 15 percent less than they would have had in the late 20th century. But just as noticeable and obviously intertwined with that is that these parties have lost their sort of distinctive profile, right? They stood for 
um, a particular vision of society where um, the government was responsible for protecting people from the negative consequences of markets, where unemployment was an anathema, where the welfare state was something that had to be defended at all costs. And obviously what happened over the course of the late 20th and early 21st century is that those things really declined. They were watered down, the left moved to the center, so to speak, on economic issues. And that really destroyed the distinctive profile that these parties had. And it began to really disengage particularly working class, low educated voters from these parties. And these voters ended up, not directly, very few of them switched directly from you know voting for the French Socialists to voting for the National Front. But over the course of a generation, what we've seen is a lot of these voters just left. Mm -hmm. They don't vote anymore. And then maybe came back and voted for a right-wing party. But the, le the um, younger generations, right, in these categories of working class, low educated voters, now do not vote for the left. They vote for the populist right. So there is a huge generational shift, which is why so many of these left wing parties, quote unquote, left wing parties in Europe now have such an old profile. Their voters are really mm -hmm. much older than that of the electorate. So this kind of watering down of their economic profile um, had a whole variety, I would say, of um, you know, really significant, if unintended, electoral consequences, mm -hmm. political consequences, and economic consequences. Because without that left-wing, strong mm -hmm. left-wing champion, it's just become much easier to, um, you know, to change the way um, economic policy making yeah. is done well, in Europe. So that's another thing we can blame on neoliberalism. Neoliberalism yes. being uh, uh, defined, you know, in narrow terms, a kind of free market, you know, fundamentalism of the uh, Milton Friedman variety and Bill Clinton and Tony Blair exemplified yep. that shift to the center. They accepted globalization, free trade, and that made them not so different from their center-right uh, uh, counterparts. But um, it is striking that you can't just go back. You know, I mean, that would be one strategy. I mean, if the left isn't offering a real alternative, then go back to the leftism of the you know the 1960s. Um, mm -hmm. But that didn't work. Jeremy mm -hmm. Corbyn was a big failure in, in Britain. I mean, he was probably the clearest effort to just turn back the clock ideologically. Huh? Well, yes and no. So he clearly had a more left-wing economic profile, but he married that with a probably even further left profile on culture and social issues. And obviously what's happened, as we've already discussed over the last couple of decades, is voters have really shifted around a lot, right? And so those kind of working class, low educated voters, who by the way, always had that kind of mix of generally left-wing preferences on economic issues, but generally conservative preferences on social and cultural issues, that has not changed. And in fact, over the course of the last decades, these voters have gotten more uh, progressive. I, I hesitate to use that term because what we're talking about is kind of less conservative in the way that these things are normally defined by public opinion scholars. Those voters haven't shifted at all. What's shifted though are the parties, right? Mm -hmm. And so now when you think of the left in the U.S. or even in Western Europe, what comes to mind now just as much as potentially left-wing economic policies, less than you would have, as we've already discussed, a uh, few decades ago, but left-wing positions or progressive positions on social and cultural issues. That is That's not... like feminism. Feminism, gay, environmentalism, yeah. multiculturalism, uh, traditional values, depending on your, you know, your background, um, you know, yes, all of these uh, mm -hmm. gender-related issues. And that's not where these other voters are. Mm -hmm. And so winning them back with a mix of left-wing economic positions and left-wing social and cultural positions is going to be very difficult if their minds are focused on those left-wing um, non-economic positions, because that's not mm -hmm. where they are. And there's now already a party out there, whether it's the Republican Party in the U.S. or right-wing populist parties in Europe that's ready to mobilize them mm -hmm. on these other issues. So when these voters are focused on non-economic issues, when those are their priorities, those are the things they're thinking about, 
they're not going to vote for the left. Yeah. Which is why, for instance, anybody who's watching this in the United States understands why the Republicans do what they do. It's, it's wise politics for mm -hmm. them because as long as voters are keeping their minds on culture wars and drag queens and other cultural issues, they can hold a coalition together that is otherwise very divided on economic issues. Mm -hmm. It makes perfect sense for them. They are doing the logical thing to build a broad coalition. The Democrats, on the other hand, have a majority in public opinion polls behind them on economic issues. Mm -hmm. But insofar as voters' minds are conflicted about whether to think of the Democrats first on these economic issues or on these non-economic issues, it's, it's more difficult for Democrats to hold those right. different groups together. Now, it does seem to me that identity politics has taken hold among progressives uh, to the point where many of them are really actually no longer liberals. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they actually don't buy into liberalism and the same kind of canons of tolerance and so forth as their parents or grandparents, but that it's a little bit different in Europe. I mean, you have intolerant people on the left that were always intolerant because they were economically left, but identity politics in general seems to be a little bit milder and not so deeply entrenched in Europe. Why, why is that? Well, I think it's because of something we talked about before, because mm -hmm. of the history of racial, uh, our, our racial history in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. The history of slavery, its legacies, racial discrimination. Mm -hmm. And so those issues are just much deeper embedded in American history and obviously cause much more pain. I mm -hmm. mean, the people who live in this country who trace their legacies back to slavery, obviously for them this is a very different issue than for immigrants who came to European countries in the last generation, or to, which is not to say that they don't face significant amounts of discrimination, but it's a very different kind of situation. It's not as deeply embedded in the politics and the society and the economy as um, you know, sort of the legacy of slavery is mm -hmm. in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's why it's somewhat milder in Europe. Although some of the same tendencies, you know, do exist mm -hmm. um, that we've seen in in the U.S. Yeah. Now let's talk about how this relates to geopolitics because it is quite remarkable that these right wing uh, parties in Europe and Donald Trump and much of the MAGA movement in the United States is actually kind of flipped on the question of Russia, mm. right? When Obama was president, the, Repu the Republicans were constantly, you know, attacking him for being soft on Russia, and now there actually seems to be a genuine uh, fondness for Putin and Putinism. Uh, you see the similar sort of thing with Marine Le Pen in France. Uh, uh, not so much Georgia Maloney has actually been pretty good on that, but certainly Matteo Salvini, one of her mm. coalition partners, you know, famously had a Putin t-shirt and yeah you know. and Silvio, Ber Silvio Berlusconi was just recently in the news for tweeting his support of Putin but noticeably got shot down mm -hmm. immediately by Maloney now I don't know what's in Georgia Maloney's <laughs> in her heart I mean yeah. maybe she loves Putin and has a Putin t-shirt at home too but the point is is that she understood that that was not gonna fly mm -hmm. right that if she wanted to keep Italy um, in that European coalition, she wanted to keep money flowing to her. She wanted Italy to be taken seriously as a European, you know, power. That that was not going to fly, right? Mm -hmm. Not the case. Again, in the United States, that's a big difference. I mean, uh, you know, Marine Le Pen also clearly had some sympathy in her heart for Putin. Has taken money from Russian banks with ties to him. Blah blah blah. But she also had has been forced at least again, openly to distance herself from them. Now, again, what's in her heart, I don't know. But it's interesting, the different, again, to get back to our mm -hmm. original question, the different dynamics. Now, in the United States, clearly the sort of sympathy from Putin comes from two things. One is he's a nasty dictator um, who pretends that he is some kind of, you know, champion against wokeism, which yeah. is just absurd or and ridiculous. A yes, or, you know, a, a, yes, a supporter of, you know, Christianity and Christian values. That's obviously ridiculous, but the weakness for that kind of, um, you know, sort of, uh, uh, that kind of argument is just really sympathetic, I mean, really um, a reflective of some very deep pathologies that, um, you know, are, are within the Republican Party. But also this kind of America First has, has you know, um, tapped into a deeper strand of isolationism 
in um, you know American history and American mm -hmm. conservatism, the desire to just you know we don't want to be involved with other people. It's not our position to support democracy abor abroad to fight against um, dictatorships. Um, and I'm not obviously speaking just in the military sense, but to you know stand up mm -hmm. for. Um, democratic values and democratic systems. They're just not interested in that at all. And so, um, you know, again, that has been much more, if not widespread, condoned within the Republican Party than um, similar trends in Europe. Now, of course, the fact that the Putin's invasion was on European soil makes that issue much more resonant, right? So, so let's let's be clear about that. But again, nonetheless, very different. Um, kinds of dynamics on mm -hmm. the other different sides of the Atlantic. Yeah. Okay, well, if we could close with a little bit more speculative uh, kind of discussion. Mm -hmm. If you want it, so uh, I'll tell you my personal preferences. I mean, I really do think it's important to have a serious left alternative in a democracy. Uh, the degree of inequality in the United States, in Britain especially, but in many places has really gotten to be uh, you know, problematic to the point that it's actually threatening the stability of our democracies. And so I do think you actually want more redistribution, more social programs that buffer people against the market. <coughs> uh, if you take that position and you see this shift of the working class away from the parties that traditionally supported it, what kind of a program would you offer them? I mean, how would you get those voters back? So that's a great question, and in fact, it's probably the key question for anyone, not only who favors a strong democratic left, but I would say favors small-d democracy, right? Mm -hmm. It's very hard for me to see how democracy works without a left that is um, committed to democracy, committed to capitalism, but also committed to reconciling them. That is to say, changing the way capitalism works so that it doesn't create these kinds of divisions in society. I think it's important, though, to recognize that what the right has done in the United States in particular has been a generational project, right? This started, um, you know, during the heyday of liberalism, um, you know, with Barry Goldwater and a whole variety of other conservative intellectuals and movements recognizing that um, if they wanted to change what was then the dominant, mm -hmm. indeed maybe hegemonic, New Deal liberal consensus, that this was going to take a generation to do. So what does the left need to do? It needs to build a strong coalition around progressive values that are both social and economic. Um, right now, though, it has to recognize that it does not have a majority of the electorate, indeed even a majority of its own voters, who agree with the more left-wing versions of social positions. And so that leaves it with a few different options. One is it can just continue to, as you would put it, um, you know, kind of ram these things down people's throats in a somewhat illiberal way um, and just say, look, these things are so important, we are so unbending on them that we're just going to do it regardless of what the electoral consequences are. That, I think, is both a recipe for electoral disaster and I would say somewhat non-democratic because if you're in a democracy, it's your job to, mm -hmm. you know, bring people along. The second thing you can try to do is what the Republicans have done, which we talked about before, just try to just deflect attention away from these issues, which is to say, never talk about them. Um, do what you're going to do, but do not make that part of your profile and just hope you can get away with passing the laws and changing things without sort of people recognizing it. The Republicans have been relatively successful, again, in blurring on economic issues and pushing on the social issues. You might be somewhat successful with that, although, again, I suspect the Republicans are not going to let you do that. The third strategy is the one that I think is both best electorally and best democratically, that is to say small d democracy, which is if you believe that these positions are the correct ones, the right ones for the country, then you have to persuade voters of them. And you're not going to do that by telling them that they are immoral, that they are racist, not that there aren't people who are not, but that if they don't agree with you 100% on things like affirmative action or how to deal with transgender folks, that they are just evil, irredeemable, and have to be socially ostracized. Or worse. You just cannot convince people. You cannot persuade people by demonizing them and not listening to them. So the best strategy over the long term is if you believe in these positions, you being a person of the left, um, then you have to figure out ways to persuade people to come along with you. That's the way to gain voters, and it's also the way 
to be consistent with democracy because democracy requires you to compromise and to argue and to learn how to convince people of things that you think are best for the country. And so I think over the long term, that's the only way that um, the big D Democratic Party, Big D, mm -hmm. um, is going to be able to build a broad coalition of folks who yeah. are united both around economics and around non-economic issues. Yeah, well, that's, I think, the, the heart of it. Uh, I've been in several discussions. Shadi Hamid just did a book uh, mm -hmm. about basically saying we needed to tone down liberalism. And I think that, you know, the problem with his argument is he's identifying liberalism with this very rigid, you know, progressivism, mm -hmm. uh, especially on gender, race, ethnicity, these sorts of issues. Whereas, you know, I think a true liberal believes in tolerance, which means tolerance for views that are different from your mm -hmm. own. And I think that that's kind of what's gone missing in, you know, important parts of the uh, American left. And they need to realize that they're actually, you know, still uh, liberals in the end uh, because they live in a very pluralistic society where not everybody agrees on these kinds of mm -hmm. issues. For sure, so, yes. Okay, Sherry, when is your new book? I mean, do you have a target date for when this is going to come out? Uh, I don't know, but um, hopefully in the next um, couple of years. I'm just really starting to work on it now, and I, all of these conversations like this really help me think it through. So, But hopefully in a couple of years. Okay, well, we'll look forward to it yeah. very much. Thank you. <coughs> so thanks for talking. My pleasure.